Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Harkness and I'm the Programming Manager here at Portland Public Library. And today we're thrilled to be hosting um, today's literary lunch with Gretchen Legler and Severin von Scharner Fleming. Uh, they will be discussing their respective publications, Woods Queer and the Greenhorn, Greenhorn's New Farmer's Almanac, along with Agrarian Living in Maine and Farming in a Modern World in, world in general. We're, um, we've been looking forward to this talk for a very long time. So thank you, thank you, Gretchen and Severin for being here. Um, and I just wanna introduce these writers. They have rich, full lives. And uh, so I'll just do a short blurb about each, but we'll learn more about them as the conversation progresses. Um, Gretchen Legler is the author of On the Ice, an intimate portrait of life at McMurdo Station, Antarctica and also All the Powerful and Visible Things, a sportswoman's notebook, which received two Pushcart Prizes. She's a professor of creative writing at the University of Maine at Farmington, and she lives in Farmington with her partner, Ruth. And Severin von Scharner Fleming is an organic farmer, young farmer's advocate, publisher, and organizer based in Down East Maine. Severin serves as director of the Grassroots Young Farmers Cultural Organization, Greenhorns, which produces a literary journal, which we'll be, she'll be talking about today, for working agrarians called the New Farmers Almanac. Severin travels and speaks nationally and internationally on land access, food sovereignty, and the needs and vision of the incoming generation of farmers and ranchers. She is currently at work on a book about land reform. Um, so Gretchen and Severin, I'll turn it over to you and thanks everyone for being here. We're right. Hi, Severin. Hi, Gretchen. <laughs> Who's your friend there? This is Shoopy. Hi, Shoopy. I have a little friend too. This is Fox. <laughs> we wanted to have uh, multi species representation. So that's cool. Got it. <laughs> so um, I thought, well, you know, I. We're going to go back and forth here, but I, I'm just so excited that I, I thought I would just jump in and go first um, and first thank uh, Rachel and Becca from the Portland Public Library Literary Lunch. And I really wish we could be there in person having a literary lunch together and that'll happen soon enough, I hope. Um, but I just wanted to say how excited I was when I got my copy of the Greenhorns um, Grand, Grand Land Plan, which is the, new, the newest edition of the New Farmers Almanac. And I didn't know what to expect. Um, I should have known to expect something really exciting and new, but this, this almanac is great reading, full of art, full of poetry, full of beautiful literary writing and full of hope, which is so, wonderful at this point in time. Um, so I, I'm so curious about the Greenhorns and, um, oh, and then there's Wood Square there. <laughs> um, so I'm so curious about the Greenhorns and I just wanted to start by maybe having us each share our story of how we came to Maine, how we came to be doing what we're doing in Maine, how you came to be a farmer and activist and writer and publisher. And then um, maybe I could share my story of my my little farm that I wrote about in Woods Queer. Does it sound all right to do that? Awesome. Okay. Do you want to go? Want to go first, or do you want me to go first? You want I want to you to go first because I really want to know what your story. <laughs> well, it's funny because um, whenever I tell people in other places where we are. You know, and I'm like, well, Nova Scotia comes down, and they're like, where's Nova Scotia? <laughs> and then I often end up saying, yeah, you know, down East Maine, it's like the Alaska of New England. And people are like, oh, yeah, there's all these parts of New England that are actually pretty far away from the middle parts. And so then to see that you came from the real Alaska to Maine, where, where it's much relatively tamer, actually. Um, uh, intrigued me. And um, I've been reading the book by Kim Stanley Robinson about the ministry of the future and all these uh, Antarctica heads. Are you got it on your desk right there? No, I'm just going to write it down. <laughs> um, well, there's all these Antar there's all these uh, 
Antarctica heads and Alaska uh, oil drillers who become involved in trying to geoengineer glaciers to save to you know save humanity. And it's also the same. It's off. It's the same context where you have people who became acculturated in one extreme environment applying themselves in another extreme environment and kind of flip-flopping and it felt kind of apropos the you know the queering of a philosophical life or the um how the landscape becomes a, a medium for you know inward journey and um how those how they like how there's so much switching back and forth and in and out that happens as soon as you're involved in ecology on a day-to-day -day basis but okay so i came to maine i came to maine five years ago to start this farm i came a few years before to work on other people's seaweed operations um harvesting wild algae that are prolific in the gulf of, in these cold waters of the gulf of maine nourished by the downspout of the labrador current and the upspout of the gulf stream and that um, is a very, very rich uh, marine environment that uh, is highly generative for in plankton terms and also in algal terms. And so where I am on Cobscook Bay is uh, extremely productive marine environment. And um, in the 1800s, there were 27 canneries on the shores here. Wow. Now there are none. Um, but the, the motivator was algae. And we relocated Greenhorns here because of, you know, we were in an office space, we were in a rented shed, we were here, we were there. And after moving, you know, what's now 8,000 books about eight times in, you know, each time in boxes that weigh about 80 pounds, uh, I swore I wouldn't move them again until we, you know, had some security. And so we now are housed in an odd fellows hall from 1890 that's strong enough to hold them all and came with a bunch of velvet sofas. And then the farm is just down the road. So we can have greenhorns have an event space and a workshop space and a library space. And then I can farm and we can have kind of this arrangement within the village of this tiny town of Pembroke where we can be activists and also farmers and you know work on these kind of cultural and literary projects and have workshops but also actually farm. And so that's the short version of why we are in Pembroke, Maine. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like that's also a part of your quest is the, the balanced life or the imbalance of one part of life spilling over into a, a fruitful um, abund abundance in other dimensions. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it, yeah. So the the farm I wrote about uh, wrote about in the book Woods Queer was located in near Jay, Maine, which is um, here in the western mountains of Maine. There are a bunch of in Franklin County, a bunch of small towns all hooked together, um, and between them, countryside. And you were talking about how in the eighteen hundreds there were you know twenty seven canneries in Cobscook Bay. Well. In the 1800s, most of the land around here was farmland. Um, it had been woods, and then it was, um, you know, transformed into farmland, and all these stone walls went up. And you might know more about this than I do, but there was a period of time when one of the most popular um, um, practices around here was sheep farming. Um, and then change came to the land, and People stopped farming, and um, I, I want to learn more about this history, but they moved west, and then the land that was farmland grew up to woods. Um, so the farm that my partner and I had was about 80 acres of wooded, mixed woods and a little bit of uh, pasture um, that we turned into um, a small farm. We never sold anything. Um, and we never managed to get into any kind of a commercial enterprise, but we grew enough vegetables in two huge gardens to 
feed ourselves most of the year. We put food by, we learned how to can and do all that other can and dry and freeze and do all that wonderful stuff. We raised chickens for meat and chickens for eggs. Um, we gave away a lot of our, well, we gave, we gave away a lot of our eggs. Um, we gave away a lot of our vegetables. Um, we also raised goats and ate uh, goat meat and made um, goat yogurt and goat cheese and um, really um, got into the rhythm of a life that was lived in accordance with the seasons, right? Um, and I really, I, it's hard to say what drew me to that life. I have farmers in my background. My mother's parents were Swedish immigrant farmers in Minnesota. Um, but, you know, before the, in the 19th century. And so I knew about farming from that experience and from visiting my grandparents' farm. Um, but my parents were suburbanites, basically. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Salt Lake City, Utah. And the biggest garden my mother planted there was probably an eight by 10 plot. But there's something in me that has always wanted to farm. I don't know where that came from, but um, when we moved to Maine, my partner and I, Ruth, were looking for a place to settle down, and we bought this little, beautiful little house, tiny little Cape, and, and it had 80 acres of land, and almost immediately we started um, the vegetable garden, which grew and grew and grew, and um, pretty soon after that, I decided I wanted goats and then chickens, and um, it was... Um, in, I have to say that uh, in part, I think the impulse was uh, to connect. Um, and I think a lot of people can relate to that right now, um, to connect with land, to connect with animals, to connect with seasons, to connect with myself. Um, the subtitle of the book is Crafting a Sustainable Rural Life. And for me, I think that sustainability was sustainable, a sustainable relationship with a with a place that I could call home and a sustainable relationship with another person. So the book is partly about farming in that particular way that will give a, that will create food for a family, but it's also about creating sustainable relationships with my rural neighbors, um, with the wild animals in the woods, with the wild foods in the woods. Um, but you know, what actually got me to Maine was a job teaching creative writing at the University of Maine Farmington <laughs> and the rest came after that. Um, yeah. Well, and, and of course, you know, I feel like we have to explain ourselves as kind of like the agrarian literary corner of the universe. I remember being at a picnic table in the sun and the convening held by uh, the Dark Mountain Project in, in Wales. And the Dark Mountain Project, for those of you who might, might not know, is a pretty obscure but very cherished um, kind of deep ecology, but but also quite apocalyptic Anthropocene, me, uh, poetry and visual art and essay collection that comes out twice a year, I think, and is very international and highly regarded and and pretty dark also. And then we were sitting in this picnic table and we realized that we were all the kind of like farming, the kind of farm flank of that. Um, we were like, oh, this is the sunny valley near the dark mountain where we all, you know, subsist and participate in our own survival and believe that there's a sunny future ahead mm -hmm. and um, that we're going to squeak through. And so uh, I realize that that's a minority portion of the larger literary scene, but having spent 10 years now uh, facilitating the almanacs, I have the 2013, 2015, I don't have the two others, and there's five, and now we're working on the most, six. The most recent one. The most re recent one, and well, that one is the most recent one that's on paper, but there's, ho oh, oh, ho, it's already growing, there's already seedlings in the greenhouse. Uh, of the next one. And so, you know, each one of these books is full of, um, you know, 100 people who are all living lives on the land and who are mostly not writers um, and who are mostly, you know, 
practitioners of um, agroecology um, and urban context in rural context, you know, people farming on church land, people farming in, you know, where the sidewalk ends, um, people who are kind of more arts affiliated, many people with day jobs that are to sustain their, you know, pathway into agriculture and, um, and many of them, you know, having to live these kinds of queer or intersectional lives in order to, you know, make it over the hump into being able to um, uh, afford in a capitalist society to participate in subsistence um, behaviors and to, you know, be physically participatory with their own survival on an uh, everyday and a nutritional uh, level and to be part of and implicated in the survival of their larger community which uh, you know as it turns out is a, a great privilege when everything has been commodified uh, in our in our day-to-day um, -day world yeah. and what's wonderful about being here uh, in the sea and what's been wonderful is we get you know we work through the different uh like thematics like this one was agrarian technology and we had one on the commons this last one was about kind of planning and um you know what would a new green new deal look like how would we apply our land use insights and land healing insights as agrarians um in a civic context which by the way yes my parents were urban planners uh in cambridge massachusetts <laughs> Um, and but now we have one that's kind of a post COVID one about um, adjustments and accommodations and uh, shifting and, and reacting. Um, but what's been fascinating and, and fabulous about the this place here and the kind of conversations that are happening in Maine right now and clean water and aquaculture and ocean rise and extreme weather has been how um the private property context that felt you know in the in the first volumes you know we the whole time we're rebelling against private property and land access and how do we get our little corner of land and wishing for a new homestead act and all sorts of um all sorts of you know reframing of the propagandas of the wars and uh re re uh jiggering our kind of posture now so much of the land question has um, the, the land question and the questioning of land and whose land and land back and right to land and um, land loss are you know have become so much more normative in mainstream society and uh, and that in fact uh, every year the ocean takes about six feet of the land off the front of my my farm. And, uh, you know, you realize that the private property is arbitrary, uh, violent, and uh, temporary. So that even if you make it, you know, to having your own farm after, you know, 13 years of wanting to have one's own farm, you know, then in fact, you know, what is it anyway? So it all is a big circle of inquiry and release and um, circling around together but what's the point of this yeah i'm not i wasn't surprised by anything i read and i really hope you'll submit and that we can <laughs> submit to a friendship together across time and space and all the people who recommended you are also on the top hit list of um <laughs> of writers who also garden yeah 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 so severin one of the things i want to talk about um it's really important to me and i've really been thinking a lot about is you talked about being on the sunny the sunny flank of the environmental literary whatever it was dark, the dark <laughs> mountain the dark yeah with the sunny side of the dark mountain and um um, I started a garden at the University of Maine Farmington. It's just this little, there was a building that was torn down on campus and um, we had some money from a grant from, um, and so we got the administration to, to allow us to start a garden. And one of the reasons I wanted to start a garden is because in my 
in my years and years of teaching as a university professor, I've like in the last six years, I've seen a lot of anxiety and stress in students around um, environmental issues. And, but also um, a lot of kind of, um, I think I would call it paralysis, you know, a sort of a not knowing what to do. So my answer to that was, okay, we need to refresh our spirits. We need to, by connecting with the earth, by just being, by getting our hands in the dirt, by planting seeds, by watching things grow. And we need to know we're doing something good. We need to know that we're on the sunny side of the dark mountain. We need some sunshine. So, so there's this little garden on campus. And later after this interview, we're gonna have this garden open house where students are gonna plant some peas and onions. So, but, you know, okay. So the question is how does, in the, in the beginning of the new Almanac, you have this wonderful introduction that's so inspiring and basically say, there's work for us now. Let's all rise to the work. We know what the work needs to be. Let's let's do it and let's do it together and let's do it joyfully and hopefully. So um, I guess the question is, um, there just there seems to be this disconnect with knowing what needs to be done and actually knowing what to do. And I keep trying to convince myself that my own little farm my own little sustainable operation with my partner, with my neighbors and the little garden at school is, is social change in action. Um, but it's also hard for me to believe that something so little can make any kind of a difference. So the question for you is how does, how do, how does, social, ch how does social change happen? How, and, and do you feel like the work you're doing is making a difference? Well, if the specific work is the work of, you know, pulling together and, you know, a lot of it is like reminding really smart, wonderful people to frigging send in their papers. So that may be a little bit like being a, a professor who has homework assignments and has to, you know, force their star students to please, will you humble yourself to the written page? But the, the writers are, um, the writers are thinkers too, and the workers are thinkers too. And I, I think one of the great points about living a life in agriculture is that you have more time to think, mm. and and that you, um, and that in the and that in that um, working way, new thoughts arise, and so. When I also observe, you know, a lot of young humans coming into agriculture and, you know, squaring off to adversity after adversity after adversity. And, you know, when you have the young ones who show up on the farm and it's cold in April, I, you know, this week, and it's like, oh my God, now we have to screw on all these cold, awkward, rusty um, hose bits together, you know? And it's like, why do we need hoses? It's raining and freezing cold, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's hard. Like, it's a little bit like hazing to go through um, what it takes to um, mechanically and um, agronomically prepare for, for the work. And, and, and we've been programmed as young people in this, you know, we white wired Western we, who go to college or, you know, are, are thought best to go to college, um, to be extremely threatened by not knowing how to do stuff and not being able to meet an expectation or um, have to figure it out by ourselves, painfully, you know, miserably, urgently. Wow, that's uncomfortable in a in a culture of instant gratification and you must be excellent and why didn't you think of that uh and, which is so inferred by by consumer culture and so whenever i'm like damn it you goddamn entitled millennial just humble down and stare at the problem for a little while that's what you're here to do you know you're here to be confronted with your own inadequacy and get okay you know get comfortable with it 
And that's a part of the social practice that all of us who commit to agriculture have to, you know, like you have to walk into that through that curtain and it's dusty and velvet and hard, but then you're through the curtain and then you're like, oh yes, I can, you know, I can fail at anything. <laughs> Or, you know, I can limp through most things. And, but what's the point of that? I mean, hmm. it's not, it's not their fault hmm. is what I'm, that's the, after I, you know, grump is like, okay, they, you know, these are young people who weren't protected from billions of dollars of marketing telling them that every product was for them and they're so important and it's also special and it's also sexy and it's all about how great they are and all these things that are you know completely the opposite of cherishing observing serving releasing surrendering which are the practices that um become inherent to a a, a life caring for a super complex ecosystem that's a that's a parcel of land or a farm business or even just you know today we're out harvesting algae you know and it has to be it has you have to go when it's early and cold you have to pick it where it's cold it's windy you have to think about where are you going to go vis-a-vis -vis the wind then it has to be not get hot but then it has to be completely dry and all of these things require that you you know orient your body in a certain direction and anticipate and have urgency um and uh i mean i think the good news is you get better at it i think mm -hmm. the the harder news is that um unless we well or i would say the premise of doing a literary project is that we have to verbalize what that process feels like in order to draw the next water molecule down the hose with us because we won't be able to do it alone and we won't be able you know to to you know either save the world or save ourselves if only a hyper minority of humans is participating in our in the food system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that as this kind of now green energy win win techno optimist version of what you know could be the way that uh booster a uh, boostering big d democrat wants to experience the world um that is not compelling and it is not truthful we can, we cannot convert to solar and wind and have what we have now and it will all be fine it will entail that green energy uh, version of a, a, a comfortable non-changing future will entail the poisoning and destruction of rivers and mountains that um, you know will never be re reparable, you know, in biological time, and um, that in fact the transformation of what we expect from and the stories we tell ourselves about what our lives mean and what we do with our lives um, really, really matters. And if more and if more of us don't figure out how to cluster together or act alone or um, combine with um, many kinds of methodologies in land repair, in urban agriculture, in urban forestry, in agroforestry, in restoration ecology, in aquaculture, in all of these fields, if we don't have a massive moreness of human effort applied to this project, um, yeah, then you definitely have a lot to be afraid of. Hmm. Um, as the age of consequences spills over us. And so um, I feels like we don't just have a duty to act. And, you know, what we say a lot is like, what's left is what's left to us and, you know, pick up your share and get to it. And, but also that we, we have to say how it was for us in that vulnerable part, because other people are going to have to cross over that threshold as well. And I feel like that's what you're doing in here. You know, you're like, oh my God, what does the death of a rooster mean for me psychologically? Well, it takes about 50 pages, actually. You know, and that, what does that, um, what, what does the, how much work it is actually uh, encountering our, you know, our traumas? And, but then you encounter your traumas and you move on and you have eggs for breakfast. You know, we're not like stuck in a loop. 
right. or at least the loop. Well, anyway, are we stuck in the loop? That's a good question. Well, hopefully we're not stuck in a loop. You know, I love this idea of um, moving the next water molecule down the spout with you. Um, and um, also, so figuring out a way to, to you know, um, do something that um, feels like you're um, contributing to the good, you're doing work that needs to be done and um, figuring out a way to bring somebody else along with you. Um, but also that idea that we don't have to have it figured out. We can, we can go into it and we can, um, we can figure it out as we go along and it's not easy and there's not one answer um, and that it's messy, doing this work is messy. Um, and that maybe we don't know if the little garden that we started on campus is going to make any difference in the world. Um, we know that maybe the vegetables that we grew that we donated to the food bank are going to help somebody have a good lunch. Um, and maybe we don't, I mean, at this particular moment, we don't have to think beyond that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I just like the idea of the, the giving this new generation a chance to stare at the problem and figure out how to come up with a solution. Whether, you know, and, and in my case, the quote unquote solution um, was, um, you know, this little, this little farm where we really um, tried to have this sustainable life, right? And, 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 and by sustainable, what I mean is that um, on a small scale, it's something that we could keep going without, um, a major, um, ma you know, a major drain on the resources of the planet. I don't know. I don't know exactly how to say this, but I mean, we raised the chickens. We, we they ate the grass in the pasture. They, we, we fed them scraps from the garden. Um, they gave us eggs. We ate the eggs. You know, this is. We were part. We we're part of a. We became part. We became more part of a loop than we would if we, well, maybe we became part of a smaller loop than we would if we bought our eggs at the grocery store. I don't know. But there are all kinds of ways to be involved in this loop. This, it's not a 100% sustainable loop, you know, um, but it's a more sustainable loop than a lot of other Americans are living. And there are all kinds of ways to be part of a more sustainable loop, like to buy your eggs from somebody you know down the road, or to get your goat milk from somebody who milks goats down the road, or be part of a CSA, or um, shop at a farmer's market. Um, so, you right, know. But also, it's starting to become comfortable and at home in the smaller loop. Right. Yeah. And that the grandeur, well, that we can have grandeur in the literary sense and grandeur in the network sense and grandeur in the poetic uh, or um, kind of uh, metaphoric sense of what our life means. But then, but then actually, you know, I am a body of a certain size. I have arms and I have hands of a certain size. I make beds of a certain size. It takes me a certain length of time to make the bed. And, you know, that is what a human can do. I feel that um, so much of my education, again, I'm talking kind of to your young people because I feel through you. I mean, we started a farm also on our college campus in the trash dump. And I'm sure exposed ourselves to all sorts of, you know, leftover chemicals because we were like fusing pipes together and you know playing with mm. pvc glue and drinking all out of it but you know uh and at the time the college people wanted to bulldoze it and now it's on the frigging tour you know people yeah, who exactly. come to the college it's on the it's on the admissions yeah. uh yeah. prospectus what college was it just uh, that that was pomona college yeah well the same thing happened at university of maine farmington it took a year and then it got on the admissions tour. It's like, ah, we have this amazing garden. garden. Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, what you learn from having a garden that has insurance and a moderator 
and a chain link is different from what you learn when you're like ah, ninjas, you know, ripping up things out of dumpsters and chucking them in the ground. But the the point is that the always there was the the feeling like oh is this enough does this matter you know can we do it well enough you know is this big enough what if i'm just being a farmer i mean if i heard you know as somebody who spent 15 years as an organizer and convener and documenter of the young farmers movement and organizer of you know political and land trust and you know open source technology exchange and you know just like a student of this movement and how many people and how much time we have spent saying, oh, you know, so you're just a farmer. Hmm. And it's kind of like, well, let's start there. <laughs> just being a farmer. Yes. That feels like a pretty good place to start. That sounds and, and how do we and how do we make that more okay? Yeah. For the young ones. Hey, I want to read just a little bit from Woods Queer that I think um, speaks to what we're talking about. Um, and you were talking about, you know, acquiescing to our um, limitations, which I think is really super important. And I think when we acquiesce to our, it's when we acquiesce to our limitations, we can really start to do the work that we, that needs to be done. It's when we sit around and we think that we have the ability to quote unquote change the world by doing what, I don't know, snapping our fingers, that um, we get caught in that, in that um, paralysis. So anyway, this is, this is a little, it's from this section of the book called Victory Garden. And um, it takes its name from, you've probably, I'm sure everybody who's listening has heard of the, the Victory Gardens that were a part of the propaganda from the US Department of Agriculture during World War II. And the whole idea was to get people to plant gardens so that um, the machinery of production could be used for, for war instead of providing food for people at home. That was the real impetus behind it. Um, but what happened is that people started planting gardens and there were gardens everywhere. Every piece of land that could be turned into a garden was turned into a garden and some amazing percentage of the vegetables, you know, amazing percentage of food uh, to feed human beings in the United States was um, grown in those victory gardens. So anyway, so it's a little piece about knowing what you're understanding your own body and your own limitations. So I'm just gonna read a couple um, passages from it. Um, and there are these drawings that go around, along in my book that I drew that were so much fun. This one's of a uh, jar of dilly beans. So, okay. So my first serious vegetable garden occupied a tiny back, the tiny backyard of the ramshackle 19th century house. My then husband and I had bought in the working class brewers and bricklayers neighborhood on the low bluffs of the Mississippi River and the West End of St. Paul, Minnesota. By serious, I mean a garden meant to produce more than a few months of tidbits for summer salads. Craig had gardened before, big farm style gardens fenced against raccoons, woodchuck and deer that provided enough food for an entire year. Quarts of tomatoes and pickled beets, baskets of onions and leeks, Pints of dilly beans, spaghetti sauce, sauerkraut, bread and butter pickles, dusky butternut squash, dry beans, corn, all put up in the freezer or the pantry. That was what I wanted, at least a beginner's version. Being a novice, I followed Craig's lead, shoveled my share of soil to make our 12 by three foot double dug French intensive garden beds and kept up by reading the relevant chapters in the back to the land book that was his garden Bible how to grow more vegetables than you ever thought imaginable on less land than you can imagine <laughs> by John Jevons. Once we had the beds prepared, Craig turned it over to me. What should I plant? I asked. What do you like to eat? He said. What did I like to eat? I tipped my head to one side and furrowed my brow. The question was surprisingly challenging. Was it what do you like to eat? Or was it what do you like to eat? Maybe it was, what do you like to eat? Um, how about, what do you like to eat? 
first I'd have to get my mind around the you, meaning me, and then the like, and then eat, and then only then could I get to the what. And what I talk about next is about how, as a young woman growing up in the 1960s in the suburbs of Salt Lake City, Utah, I have, you know, my body was very disciplined in the ways that women's bodies all of our bodies, all of our human bodies, but women's bodies especially are. And um, I was um, I was deemed a fat kid. And so everything that I ate was, I mean, a lot of things that I ate were monitored and I had a pretty terrible relationship with food. So I didn't really have an opportunity to figure out what it was I'd like to eat. And when asked that question, I was kind of like, well, whatever. So anyway, so here's a, here's a picture of one of the vegetable gardens that Ruth and I had with all the little labels on it. Um, so then I move on to, i um, going to read another part of this. Um, in that St. Paul vegetable garden, I planted zucchini and patty pan squash, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, eggplant, green and yellow beans, lettuce, sage, oregano, and parsley. There was a bed of cabbage and onions, broccoli, cauliflower, and basil. Because of that garden, I learned to make dishes that are still my favorites. Pesto sauce from Marcella Hazan's classic Italian cookbook, rich tomato sauce, ratatouille, Provençal from the joy of cooking, zucchini relish, cabbage soup. The garden that Ruth and I, the garden that Ruth and I grew on our farm occupied a tenth of an acre two plots, 36 by 50 each. In it were things that I had come to know that I liked to eat. Fava beans, soybeans, leafy greens of all kinds, fat, white, and red onions, five varieties of garlic, three kinds of potatoes, four kinds of eggplant, parsnips, leeks. My favorite, the true Vermont cranberry pole bean, three kinds of carrots, rows and rows of tomatoes, especially for Ruth, we planted Brussels sprouts. Almost three decades separate me from my first garden, years spent getting to know myself, coming to an understanding of my hungers and the things that shape them. When I imagine myself in a garden now, I see myself squatting down next to a bed of radishes or onions, strongly balanced on my haunches, barefoot in the early morning, a cup of coffee beside me in the dirt, feeling the pull of the soil, confident and strong, thinking about what I will make for dinner. Every garden is a victory, but not like the victory gardens my mother grew up with, not a victory over a material foe, over the Nazis, or a victory for a nation, or even a victory over a fear of hunger, although it could be that too. A garden is a victory over the severing of the body from its home in the earth. A garden is a place of miracles. One takes a seed and produces something to eat. One encourages abundance out of something that looks like nothing. One produces a cornucopia of food to satisfy hunger, to delight the ear, the eye, the hand, the nose, the tongue, and the spirit. A garden poses the question, what do you like to eat? And invites the answer out of the earth itself. So I just wanted to be able to read that because I love it. <laughs> Right. And then and then the question starts to be uh, what wants to grow here? What wants to grow there? You know, what does the land want? Where where are the places that are discoverable or rediscoverable in the case of, you know, uh, unsettled and resettled? Uh, uh, well, I remember I remember being on the University of Hawaii campus and a wonderful woman who's a cultural anthropologist. And she said, yeah, right here in the middle of the path, that's where the taro wants to grow. You know, that the volition uh, or the suitability of each place to, you know, the human cultigens or the, the, the plants that we've taken under our, you know, into our armpits and into our, into our beings um, makes itself known more and more like the voice of what, where the, rhubarb wants to grow and you know yep. where the high bush blueberries want to go yeah so the so you know in the way you're talking about it the whole 
I mean, the earth is a garden, not just the little plot that you have, not your, not your necessarily just your field or your raised beds or your whatever, your flower beds, but the whole earth is a garden. Um, yeah. Well, and that, or that in the, the garden is the kind of primer or the little embroidery, that little embroidery test thing that you, you know, that they make. Yeah. Right. The little, where you learn your stitches. But then, you know, once you know your stitches, uh, you're empowered and engaged, or I don't really like that word empowered, but you start to get involved with your imagination, even if you're not allowed to tear up the common or the strip along the road, but, you know, but you start to, you start to be free and loose with what could be, uh, you know, and what vegetative strategies would be re more relevant in a high rain environment. Like we had yesterday, three inches of rain. And I'm like, well, let me tell you all my thoughts about vegetative strategies that could have been employed to, you know, make this less bad. Now hmm. we're all blocked off from that by good old private property um of uh, of actualizing but i think that you know the fact that we're cut off from that is also temporary because i think that once more and more and more of us are already fully you know with all our stitches together hmm. and we are facing these different kinds of crisis and hurricane or wildfire or pandemic or whatever the crisis is that we i think we'll start stretching our muscles out into the broader landscape more and I love that idea. I love the idea of that, you know, of a of a place where you can learn in a garden to do the to the. It's called I think it's called an embroidery sampler. Yeah, I ne I never did one, but I really like them. Right. So you practice that kind of stuff, and then you step out and you start doing other things, lar maybe larger things, maybe not, but other things. Yeah, putting your imagination to use. I like the way you think, Severin. Well, and, but it's not, you know, it's also like the ancient, ancient mind where things are spontaneous. Like this lovely woman, this mycologist came to the farm last weekend. She ran a workshop. We're growing mushroom buoys mm. so that our kelp farm won't use plastic because obviously we're here to help not put more plastic in the ocean. And so, you know, we're having this like very vulnerable public inquiry about what we could do differently and how could we have a biodegrade bio-based you know, aquaculture gear and, you know, make ourselves vulnerable as young freshmen of the sea and, you know, also freak people out a little bit, but it ca it caused for an extraordinary community conversation because we were like, here's a workshop, everyone come, what, you know, what is at stake for you in this, what is implied by this, you know, well, you know, um, you know, what have you observed and something about the fact that so much of buoy, you know buoy world is is beach trash you know it's already understood as a real crisis um but it but it's amazing how each artifact of the crisis becomes kind of a beacon for a different way and and anyway but this mycologist is so wonderful because she's talking about you know bringing the fungus back to the sea because you know the algae came into association with the fungus and became lichen and lichen was the first to colonize the rock and of course that's before all of you know plant life and so you know there's nothing better to shake your etch -a sketch with than evolutionary <laughs> biology where you're like you know you you know if, if if the if the history of you know life on earth is is this you know we are we humans you know and then we plants you know and you're like or we plants Moo mammals, you know, we're nothing. And then she was talking about how easy and effortless these things are. So she was saying, you know, there was this little, you know, before there was a cell, there was this little membrane, it was floating around and then dink, it closed. And then you had inside outside. And, mm. you know, that is the beginning of everything else. And it was spontaneous and effortless and emergent. And so it was, again, here we are in this kind of brainstorming session talking about, you know, what, how we're going to approach, you know, strategically and how we're going to scale and how we're going to infiltrate and, uh, you know, evoke, uh, you know, we've all this action, action words about, you know, the change we're going to cause in the world with our micro buoys. <laughs> and, you know, but actually, uh, actually, you know, it was mostly just thinking about it together 
that opened us up in ways that weren't forced, that weren't mechanic, that weren't, you know? Um, anyway, what's the point of any of that? Just to say, yeah, practicing is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Practicing is good. That sounds really exciting. The, the Mike, Michael, 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 Boy. Michael boys. She says Michael foam buoy because it, it is a myceliated mm -hmm. matrix of hemp mm -hmm. that's not fruiting. It's a sponge created by the mycelium. That's really great. So I think Rachel's trying to get our attention. Rachel, are oh. you trying to get our attention? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I will admit that I could have sat for another hour and listened to you talk and uh, it that felt really fast, but it's yeah. a fascinating conversation. And um, oh, there's people chatting. Yeah, no, that's good. People have been chatting questions and I, I wanted to also uh, encourage anyone here to chat us a question. We, st we have a few, but we'd love a few more. Um, let me go through the chat and see what, uh, what we got. So one question that came up is, um, what is your advice, both of you, for someone who might want to, after this amazing conversation, drop everything and start farming? <laughs> or, mm -hmm. you know, or someone that can, can what are some steps for uh, getting, making it a part of your life? Yeah, that's such a great question. This you is know, the right season for that question. Yeah, Perfect. yeah. Um, you know, it, it could be as simple as find a place to, I mean, I don't know, you know, connect with somebody, right? Um, Mofka, um, the Maine Farmland Trust, um, Severance Group, the Greenhorns, just start by connecting with somebody um, and uh, believe that you can do it. Like Severance said, you know, and I, I didn't know anything about farming when Ruth and I first started our farm, but connect with somebody and start trying things um, and be willing to make mistakes, you know, but for right now, this moment, if you have a place where you can plant some things, just start planting. Um, that would be um, something. But anyway, that's such a great question. And whoever asked it, I hope whatever you do, you, you just go for it. <laughs> Well, and the, particularly with the MOFCA, the, the MOFCA uh, has something called the uh, Apprenticeship Program and the Journey Person Program. And, you know, Greenhorns has spent 15 years creating a whole um, learning journey experience to try to welcome you into agriculture and help you figure out how to navigate and find there's the national um NCAT National Center for Appropriate Technology which is government United States government funded and it is a national directory of apprentice apprentice hosting farms and you you know can go and apprentice there um and you know and I don't mean to, to diminish the fact that, you know, going and volunteering on a farm is also something and working in a community garden is also something. I just happen to believe that a lot more of us, you know, could like stop tiptoeing around and, you know, bloody commit our lives <laughs> because obviously um, more of us need to. So why not do it? Um, and I know there's lots of reasons, but I'm glad for that question also. Yeah. And I would also say we host people here on the farm. We have um, camping, uh, like we have 10 platforms where you can rent and come and camp and participate in workshops that are kind of immersive and intersectional and, you know, family friendly in order to be able to have, you know, just, yeah, humans hanging out in a small farm context in a non-transactional way, like in a mob of happy humans eating together in the sunshine kind of a way which is not that common in our culture but that that's something that a lot of farms offer is you know pick your own and community work day and everybody mulch and everybody dig and everybody plant so those are those are um becoming more frequent i think like portals into farm world and particularly because of COVID, you know, everybody who's been growing has been having to expand and expand and had more and more interest and more and more demand and like hiring their roommate from college. And, you know, they're hiring their roommate from college because 
they need more people with different talents as part of their farm organism. So I want to just make a note, which is like farmers are easy to find. They're selling vegetables. Number one, number two, they probably all need babysitters. They all need graphic designers. They all need accountants. They all need like uh, families and aunties around their farm. And so for people who are still in the career that they have or only having you know one pinky of a time of week to participate in agriculture, there's ways to be, like you're saying, make a relationship with someone um, and being of use to a farmer who's of use to a land or of use to a watershed, you know, it can be a way that a lot of people I know are participating in agriculture. That's a great point too. Um, another question we had uh, is, I'd love to hear about how urban public spaces can be part of this conversation and how we can harness them better. Yeah, great question. Um, I don't know, I mean, Severin, I'm sure you have a lot to add about this because you're, you know, your parents were urban planners. Um, but you know, the most basic, I the most basic thing I can think of is that there are tons of places. Um, I mean, I don't consider Farmington to be urban, but it's urban rural. Um, and um, we took this piece of land that was on our campus that might have been turned in, I mean, people were talking about making it a parking lot, right? Or something like that. Um, and we took this opportunity to say, you know, this would be a great place for this little garden. Um, so just, I, and I, I'm, I'm always looking around now as I drive around places for pieces of land that look like they're not really being used. Um, they're just kind of vacant. Um, and those are perfect places for, for gardens. Um, and you know it, it can't hurt to ask. Um, and I just wanted to share one other story. I spent some time down in Cambridge, Mass. I lived in Somerville, and right next to my apartment was uh, Lincoln Park. And Lincoln Park um, had a urban garden space in it. And um, I knew that I knew that the park was a year from opening. And I called them up and I said, I'd like a space in the garden. And they said, sorry, the spaces have been gone for, for years. a year already. Yeah. yeah, because people really, really wanted, they just wanted a place, one bed to plant vegetables in. Um, so that's a way that urban spaces can be used. It's just places to grow food. Well, and we have a project this year of um, basically growing out of the grand land plan where all of this 100 humans each put forward their idea about how um, municipal state scale, you know, through conservation programs, through civic, it's through our democracy, we might enact a greater change on the land that we share, that we might be co-designers of the rules that govern the way land is used, just as we, uh, you know, ostensibly are co-designers of the laws that govern our commerce and regulate extraction and all sorts of other things. So as co-designers, what would we do? And so the, 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 that was a, you know, a major exciting adventure in the history of the United States when during the New Deal, all sorts of people were just prototyping all sorts of ways of approaching housing and, and urban forestry to your point. Anyway, so we're this summer doing a design charrette and then a two week work session that's basically prototyping what CCC would be like now in mm. response to climate change. And urban forestry is basically the primary one because the, you know, one of the primary determinants of public health is leaf area index. People who come from places with trees, leafs area is indexed high are healthier than people who come from places where there are no trees and where there's a dust blowing off a construction site into your playground and lead is coming into your eyeballs and your mouth and you are having developmental and cancer and cardiovascular and other stressors on your health. So um, the, it, the question of street trees is basically a question of you know, environmental justice and social justice. And the question of, um, how do we get it to happen more is a project, you know, for a social democracy. And a lot of it, you would say, is not land where food could be grown. 
And so then we say, oh, well, that's toxic land. You know, this is what they say in Baltimore and Philadelphia and Boston. Yeah, that's toxic. The harbor's toxic, the river's toxic, and the sidewalks are, are um, running off lead and brake pads and old smelteries and lead paint and yeah, yeah, it's toxic. Um, but, um, but there's also incremental change towards not so toxic. And, you know, like in the seaweed world, we spend a lot of time hearing about how, you know, seaweed farming is going to save the world and we're going to have scale and we're going to sequester all this carbon and it's going to be so fabulous and biofuels and biomaterials and innovation and GMO kelp and this whole like boom town of kelp. And I'm like, what about the humble, fabulous work of remediating our harbors that are contaminated with phosphorus and nitrogen and bringing that kelp and bringing that algae onto land and gently composting in situ and gently remediating and infiltrating water in the urban hydrology and humbling ourselves to getting this a little bit less toxic and then getting uphill a little more and getting that a little less toxic and then what runs off is a little less toxic because it's infiltrate, infiltrating and so you know and this of course is a work that's shared by all sorts of wonderful people and my mother's been a part of the Charles River in Boston so similar and you know, getting a swimmable Charles has been like a 17 year project for her. So wow. the people in a city can swim in the river. And now they're working with all these wonderful people who are making floating wetlands hmm. so that the plants against these hard edges of the city are in, you know, creating life. Uh, the, like basically the point of it is the solution to pollution is life. Hmm. And so, yeah, well, maybe it won't be unpolluted immediately. But we know that as soon as the tree is established, you know, the tree that grows in Brooklyn is going to have leaf litter. And maybe it's a junk tree, but from the leaf litter comes the next thing. And then maybe an elderberry and obviously dandelions. And I think if we're, if hmm. we're okay with, if maybe in your lifetime, you're only the dandelion or you're only the elderberry or you're only the junk tree, right? But of course, how long ago was that harbor poisoned? How many generations of extraction and monopoly and colonial project, you know, has that place had to endure? You think we're going to just like walk in and it's all fine? So I'm glad for that question too, because or if urbanity doesn't acknowledge hydrology in this time, wow, you guys are so flooded. <laughs> uh, you know, and even here, like we just had six pumps going in the basement. We got the old mining lodge that's right on the Penamaquan River because we want to stop the mine and, you know, have a farm store. And, but there you are in this basement with the whole of Route 1 and the whole watershed pouring off its water. And there's just no way you can keep up with that amount of water, you know, mechanically. Like you have to work upriver. So, I think that's what's going to become the that's what the project is in the CCC is basically thinking along with the water and thinking along with the power of the river and figuring out ways to approach that on private land on conservation land, you know, on public lands, but kind of acknowledging that that's going to take, you know, many years and a lot of people to accomplish. All right, I'm going to have to stop you there. I can't believe it, but it's already past one o'clock and it's yeah. been such an amazing uh, conversation. And I'm just going to read this one. Uh, this one message just came in. This has been such a lovely poetic and agricultural epistemolog ah, epistemological articulation. Both. What a great blend. Thank you so much. And I agree. Thank it's, you. And we'll keep track of you uh, through your websites and uh, the workshops that you're offering and um, look for what you're writing next. And uh, and that we're looking for writers. She's looking for yeah. writing students. Mm -hmm. And we're looking and, for yeah. writing students also. Great. So Perfect. thank you, Rachel and Becca and all the folks at the Portland Public Library and Severin. So great to meet you. Such wonderful energy. I'm, I'm really feeling I'm feeling I like the sunny side of the dark mountain right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, both of you. Thanks. All right. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Kristen. Thanks for coming. Thank you all.